Hello, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and today I'm going to be speaking about pulmonary artery embolization in the treatment of pulmonary AVMs. A pulmonary AVM is a direct and aberrant vascular connection between pulmonary arteries and veins that bypasses the lung capillary bed and causes a right-to-left shunt. These were first discovered in 1897 following the autopsy of a young cyanotic boy who had a loud pulmonary systolic brewery and a history of recurrent hemoptysis. PAVMs are rare and they occur at a rate of 2 to 3 per 100,000 people per year. They are more common in women than men and the age of onset is most common in the third and fourth decade of life. Most of these are congenital and they occur in association with HHT or hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. This is a rare disorder with a prevalence between 1 in 5,000 and 1 in 8,000. And it was first known, and perhaps is better known, as osler weber rondeau syndrome. It's named after three people who had early roles in the knowledge base of this disease. Rondeau differentiated HHT from hemophilia in 1896. Osler described the disease as an inherited disorder in 1901. And Weber published the first case series in 1907. HHT is an autosomal dominant genetic disorder with five subtypes, three of which have been linked to mutations in specific genes that are involved in normal vascular development. Vascular development requires signals from the TGF beta pathway, leading to growth of endothelial cells, the intracellular junctions between them, and the maturation of the basement membrane. Capillaries then develop into larger vessels with the recruitment of smooth muscle cells to the endothelial wall. In order to understand the genetics of HHT, it helps to understand the normal signaling pathways in endothelial cells that lead to vascular development. TGF-beta, or transforming growth factor beta, and BMP9, or bone morphogenetic protein 9, begin this signaling pathway, which is responsible for cell growth, apoptosis, smooth muscle cell differentiation, and vascular remodeling and maintenance. TGF-beta binds to a receptor and becomes phosphorylated, which then binds to the ALK1 or ALK5 receptors. In addition, BMP9 binds to ALK1. Finally, endoglin is a co-receptor for TGF-beta and helps potentiate the response at ALK1. The activation of ALK1 and ALK5 lead to phosphorylation of protein complexes which then impact normal endothelial cell proliferation, smooth muscle migration, and angiogenesis. There are two other intracellular processes at play here. The first involves VEGF. VEGF acts on PI3 kinase to increase endothelial proliferation and angiogenesis. And VEGF production is stimulated by ALK5 and inhibited by ALK1. In addition, ALK1 signaling increases PTEN, which reverses the action of PI3 kinase, thereby decreasing endothelial proliferation and angiogenesis. My hope is that you can appreciate that there are several processes which serve to balance endothelial proliferation, smooth muscle migration, and angiogenesis in normal individuals. So the question is what goes wrong in HHT? And the answer lies with the genetic mutations that have been discovered. These mutations have led to several subtypes of HHT being described. In HHT subtype 1, there is a mutation in the ENG gene on chromosome 9, which encodes endoglin. Less endoglin means less signaling via ALK1. This is the more common subtype of HHT, and more severe pulmonary AVMs are seen more often with this subtype. In HHT subtype 2, there's a mutation in the ACVRL1 gene on chromosome 12, which encodes ALK1. This also has the effect of reducing the signaling through the ALK1 receptor. In this subtype, hepatic AVMs are more frequently seen, and this makes these patients more prone to high output heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. 
in HHT subtype 5, there's a mutation in the GDF2 gene, also known as BMP9, and this also has the effect of reducing the signaling through the ALK1 receptor. Yes, there are subtypes 3 and 4, but the genetic mutations are not yet as well described as they are for the other three subtypes. There is an additional mutation that's been described on SMAD4, which is one of those protein complexes within the cell, and this has been detected in less than 2% of patients, and this can be seen in juvenile polyposis and HHT syndrome. In the three major mutations, there is less signaling through ALK1 and more through ALK5. And this promotes VEGF production and inhibits PI3 kinase, both of which stimulate endothelial proliferation and angiogenesis. There is a two-hit hypothesis which suggests that the genetic mutations associated with HHT likely require a secondary trigger for an AVM or other disease manifestation to develop. And in the case of HHT, these might include repeated injury, chronic inflammation, or VEGF overexpression. Together, all of these events lead to decreased TGF-beta transcription and a disruption of the vascular integrity and smooth muscle differentiation of the endothelium, resulting in an abnormal cytoskeleton and fragile small vessels. So the question you're probably all asking right now is why should you care about this? You wanted to hear a lecture on embolization, not about genetics. And I would just tell you that identifying the genetic pathway with blood tests that are available now can lead to better diagnosis of HHT and can certainly lead to the possibility of new targets for medically treating HHT. The clinical features of HHT include telangiectasias involving nasal mucosa, GI mucosa, and skin. In addition, epistaxis is a prominent feature of HHT. This often occurs before puberty, but almost always occurs before age 40. Cautery may help these patients, but n many patients need more advanced procedures such as uh, laser photocoagulation, embolization, or septodermoplasty to stop bleeding. And of course, AVMs are a prominent feature of this disease. They can involve the lungs, brain, spinal cord, GI tract, and liver. 70% of pulmonary ABM cases are associated with HHT, and 15 to 35% of patients with HHT will develop a pulmonary AVM. Hepatic AVMs may be observed in more than 70% of patients, but only 8% become symptomatic enough to require treatment. These can lead to significant pulmonary hypertension due to high cardiac output. HHT can be clinically diagnosed using the Curacao criteria, and this involves the three clinical manifestations I already mentioned, including epistaxis, telangiectasias, and the visceral AVMs, in addition to having a first-degree relative with HHT. And if three to four of these criteria are present, then there is a definite diagnosis of HHT. If only two are present, the diagnosis is possible or suspected, and HHT is unlikely if zero or one of these criteria are present. Present. The remaining pulmonary ABMs are acquired, and pulmonary ABMs have been reported in, associated with, in association with several conditions. They are seen with cirrhosis, and the absence of a liver-directed inhibitor of vascular proliferation may be responsible for some of these acquired pulmonary ABMs. Other conditions include infections, trauma, mitral valve disease, amyloidosis, Fanconi syndrome, metastatic cancer, constrictive pericarditis, and chronic venous thromboembolic disease. Pulmonary EVMs are often described or classified as simple, complex, or diffuse. This is the picture of the normal interface between the pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein, showing normal capillaries. In a simple PAVM, there's a single segmental feeding artery, and these make up 80% of PAVMs. Complex pulmonary AVMs have two or more segmental feeding arteries, and they make up about 20% of PAVMs. Diffuse PAVMs are very rare. They usually involve multiple segmental branches of one lobe or all branches of one segment. They can, in fact, even involve an entire lung. 
symptomatic pulmonary AVMs are actually less common than asymptomatic pulmonary AVMs. As a result, these are more commonly diagnosed by incidental imaging, systematic screening, or investigations after neurological complications than due to a workup of respiratory symptoms. On chest x-ray, these are going to be well-defined, rounded, soft tissue nodules of almost any size, but they probably need to be greater than one centimeter to be reliably seen on a chest x-ray, and they can be associated with enlarged feeding and draining vessels. They can be multiple and are typically most numerous at the lung bases, and 10 to 40% of patients with a PAVM will have a normal chest x-ray. CT is considered the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary AVMs. They can appear as a nodule due to the aneurysmal portion or as tubular areas due to the dilated feeding arteries or draining veins. And again, these are particularly in the peripheral portions of the lung. Here's an example of an axial CT showing a pulmonary AVM in the left lobe. And on these images, you can see the feeding artery and draining vein, which are both dilated, as well as the aneurysmal portion of the AVM. This is a little more evident on the coronal reconstructions on the CT. CT can also be helpful in monitoring the evolution of a pulmonary AVM. The first stage consists of a ground glass nodule or opacity due to prominence of the postcapillary venules and inflammation centered around a pulmonary artery branch. This is followed by visibility of vessels within the ground glass lesion due to the connections between the precapillary pulmonary artery and postcapillary venules. And in the third stage, there's AVM formation with an aneurysmal connection between the feeding artery and draining vein with disappearance of the ground glass lesion. These days, contrast echocardiography has become the gold standard for determining if a right to left shunt is present. This test measures microbubbles generated upon the IV injection of an agitated mixture of saline and air. Microbubbles are expected to rapidly diffuse through the alveolus when circulating through the pulmonary capillaries. An increased number of microbubbles visualized in the left heart or systemic circulation after three to eight cardiac cycles indicates the presence of a PAVM due to the right to left shunt. Visualization of microbubbles within one to two cardiac cycles indicates an intracardiac shunt. The accuracy of this test is related to the grade of the shunt. The test has a higher predictive value in more severe shunts. In a grade one shunt, there's a maximum of 30 micro microbubbles in the left ventricle. In grade two, there are 30 to 100 microbubbles in the LV. And in grade three, there's a minimum of 100 microbubbles in the left ventricle. There is a grade four shunt, which is extensive with endocardial definition. And as you can see, the positive predictive value does increase with grade of the shunt. In terms of screening, we do screen patients for HHD who have characteristics suggestive of the disorder, and we also screen first-degree family members of known HHD patients. This starts with a history and physical. By age 40, at least 90% of patients will meet the clinical criteria for HHT, and it's important to know younger patients may not meet the criteria, and this includes the symptoms of HHT, a family history, presence of telangiectasias, and presence of hypoxemia. We also look at lab tests such as a CBC, LFTs, and iron status. Genetic testing is actually not required to confirm the diagnosis in patients with a definite clinical diagnosis, but they may be used as the initial screening test for symptomatic or asymptomatic first-degree family members of HHT patients. When looking for a pulmonary AVM, a contrast echo and chest x-ray are recommended for PAVM screening in all patients at the time of the initial HHT evaluation. If negative, repeat screening can be performed either after puberty, within five years of a planned pregnancy, after pregnancy, and otherwise every five to 10 years to assess for the development of a new pulmonary AVM. If positive, chest imaging with CT is recommended to confirm the presence of a PAVM and to assess the feasibility of treatment. 
a chest CTA usually follows a positive contrast echo, because if positive, a, a pulmonary angiogram with embolization will be recommended, and if negative, an annual echocardiogram is recommended to see if the shunt identified on the initial exam is worsening. So we can diagnose these pulmonary AVMs, but so what? What's the problem with having a PAVM? And the issue is that there are several potential risks associated with this condition. The first is decreased oxygen saturation. Blood flowing through a PAVM doesn't participate in normal alveolar gas exchange. That reduces the oxygen content of blood returning to the left heart. It's common for HHT patients to have asymptomatic hypoxemia due to increased cardiac output and compensatory erythrocytosis if iron stores are sufficient to allow for hemoglobin synthesis. In addition, patients can present with shortness of breath, which can be due to the hypoxemia, but can also be due to anemia, high output heart failure due to intrahepatic shunting, venous thromboembolic disease, or pulmonary hypertension. These patients can also have exercise intolerance, cyanosis and clubbing, as well as anemia. Another risk of a pulmonary AVM is paradoxical embolization. Blood flowing through a PAVM doesn't allow physical filtration in the pulmonary capillary network. This allows for the passage of clot and other bloodborne material that's greater than seven microns in size into the systemic circulation. And this has several manifestations, including an ischemic stroke. Ischemic strokes have been reported in 9 to 18% of patients with pulmonary AVMs, but other studies have shown a much higher rate of cortical or subcortical infarcts. And the risk factors include a high-grade shunt, a high serum fibrinogen, and low serum iron levels, which is why iron levels should be monitored in these patients. PAVM patients can also suffer from migraine headaches, and these do improve when the PAVM is treated. The exact mechanism is unknown, but they may be due to paradoxical embolization of particulate matter or to modified pulmonary metabolism of vasoactive amines. PAVM patients can also have myocardial infarctions. These may have similar risk factors as ischemic, as ischemic strokes and are also attributed to paradoxical embolization. PAVM patients also have a risk of infection. Pulmonary capillaries may have an immune function by removing circulating bacteria that enter the bloodstream. Bypassing this function increases the risk of septic complications. And cerebral abscesses can be seen in 5 to 19% of patients and may be the presenting symptom in patients with occult PAVMs. A high-grade shunt increases this risk. HHT patients with PAVMs are several hundredfold more likely to develop a brain abscess compared to the genetic population, and these are significant. 50 to 80 percent of patients with brain abscesses are unable to return to work due to persistent neurologic deficits. A preceding dental procedure is actually the most common risk factor for these to occur. The last potential risk I want to discuss is hemorrhage. This can occur due to the fragile nature of the vessels within the PAVM. This can lead to rupture, which is, which is rare, but it's been estimated at 1 to 8 percent. Pregnant patients are actually vulnerable to rupture due to physiologic changes leading to increased flow through and enlargement of existing pulmonary AVMs. Rupture can also be seen if there is systemic arterial supply to the PAVM. Hemoptysis um, can be due to hemorrhage from a PAVM, but can also be due to the presence of telangiectasias. And hemothorax can also occur, and this can cause pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath. There is a medical component to the management of patients with PAVMs. Supplemental oxygen can be used to relieve hypoxemia and shortness of breath. Prophylactic antibiotics are recommended prior to dental procedures to reduce the risk of cerebral abscess formation. And iron-rich diets or iron supplements are recommended if the patients are iron deficient. Remember, iron deficiency restricts hemoglobin synthesis and erythrocytosis. This is a problem in patients with hypoxemia since they depend on polycythemia to maintain the arterial oxygen content. I have not forgotten that we're here to talk about embolization. 
An embolization was first reported in 1977 by Porsman, and the goals of embolization are to occlude the feeding vessels to the PAVM as close as possible to the nidus in order to preserve normal lung parenchyma and prevent collateral reperfusion. We also want to prevent all those risks I talked about which occur in association with the PAVM. Prior to embolization, a CTA is helpful to localize the target PAVMs, and an EKG is recommended to look for a left bundle branch block because passing the catheters through the heart can induce a right bundle branch block, which can potentially lead to a total heart block. During these procedures, standard pulmonary arterial catheterization technique is used and non-selective images are first obtained. Once the feeding artery to the target PAVM is localized, it's selectively catheterized either with a 5 French catheter, a guide sheath, or a microcatheter based on the size and based on the chosen embolic agent. 3 millimeters has classically been the threshold for embolization, but any feeding vessel that can be catheterized should be embolized. And in addition, symptomatic lesions should always be treated irrespective of the size of the feeding artery. When catheterizing these vessels, it's important to use good technique to keep the system free of air bubbles and clot to avoid iatrogenic paradoxical embolization. In addition, pressure should be measured in the pulmonary artery in order to know if pulmonary hypertension is present because PAVM closure could potentially increase PA pressures and that's going to be a problem in a patient with pre-existing pulmonary hypertension. The embolic agents used during a PAVM embolization are typically mechanical. Flow-directed agents shouldn't be used because of the risk of non-target systemic embolization once they pass through the AVM. So let's talk about coils. All coils can be used with success in the embolization of pulmonary AVMs. Detachable coils do have an advantage as the initial coil or coils placed due to their control and the low risk of migration through the nidus. 3D configured coils may be helpful as the initial coil due to their compact configuration once they're deployed. Usually multiple coils are needed and the goal is to place the coils as close as possible to the nidus of the PAVM. The use of coils is associated with some issues. First off, the procedure times can be long because multiple coils are needed to occlude the feeding artery, and persistence rates of 4 to 57 percent have been reported. The use of coils in vessels smaller than 3 millimeters can be associated with a high persistence rate. And in addition, it's important to look at the coil to sac distance because that can also be directly correlated with persistence. So again, coil should be placed as close as possible to the nidus when embolizing PAVMs with small or any size vessels. The use of plugs alone or in combination with coils might be a better primary option for embolizing PVMs due to a lower rate of recanalization and a lower rate of repeat embolization. In addition, the bulkier nature of a plug compared to a coil makes it less likely for them to migrate through the nidus. Both the MVP and the Amplatzer plug have demonstrated success with pulmonary AVM embolization. The thing to remember about plugs is that it may not always be possible to get the appropriate delivery catheter close to the nidus of the PAVM. And this is a potential advantage of the MVP since a microcatheter can be used to deploy the 3 millimeter and 5 millimeter versions of this plug. And just here are some examples of a case when an Amplatzer plug was used for embolization and when an MVP plug was used for embolization. The results of embolization are good. Short-term improvement in arterial oxygenation, shortness of breath, and heart failure have been reported. And on a long-term basis, there's a decreased probability of paradoxical embolization with a lower risk of stroke and cerebral abscess. And there's also a decreased risk of hemoptysis and hemothorax. While embolization is a durable procedure, failure can occur for several reasons. Recanalization has been reported as high as 17 to 20 percent, and this can be seen with a large feeding artery diameter, use of a small number of coils, use of oversized coils resulting in an insufficient mechanical occlusion, 
a lack of dense coil packing, and an embolization that's more than one centimeter proximal to the nidus of the AVM. Other potential causes of treatment failure include supply from a previously dormant or unrecognized accessory artery, development of new collaterals from pulmonary arteries, and development of systemic collaterals. Embolization can be associated with other potential risks, including pleuritic chest pain, which can occur in 15% of patients. The incidence of this increases when the feeding artery is greater than eight millimeters, and this post-procedure pleuritic chest pain is usually self-limited and can be well controlled with NSAIDs. Stroke or embolus can occur with thrombus dislodging during the procedure, and an air embolism can occur as well, which is a technical issue, and this too can have embolic implications in the systemic and coronary arteries. Non-target embolization can compromise normal lung parenchyma, and additional potential risks include lung infarction or infection, new or worsening pulmonary hypertension, and vessel injury or dissection, including access site complications. This lecture wouldn't be complete without talking about surgery. The first pneumonectomy for a PAVM was reported in 1942, and it was the preferred treatment by 1959. Today, surgery is rarely done for this reason. It's reserved for diffuse AVMs or AVMs that have failed embolization therapy, causing a patient to remain symptomatic. It may also be used if embolization is not available. Patients who have undergone an embolization procedure should be followed six to 12 months after embolization, and then every three to five years, given the risk of recanalization. CT should demonstrate a reduction in size of the nidus and the absence of enhancement in the treated feeding arteries. And symptomatic recurrence at any time should prompt a CTA of the chest to be performed. In conclusion, embolization has changed the way patients with pulmonary AVMs are treated and has allowed many patients to avoid the well-established risks of this condition.